Okay, thank you everybody for coming tonight. And we got an amazing, who was here last night? Okay, there was a great Hakadama last night. I honestly, it was crazy, Ashkacha. Three weeks ago, I was already preparing this year. You'll see there's a lot of Marmakamos here, and this is just one part. There's probably, we're gonna choose from 100 sources over the next few weeks and, and break them up into bite-sized pieces and hopefully keep it short and sweet each year. But we're hopefully gonna cover the entire gamut of, of these concepts, and there's a lot to speak about. Last night, was Rabbi Kessin giving us one derech within this sugya called Mashiach Tchias Hameisim in Olam Haba. But there are many, many machlokisim within it about what's going to happen, what it's going to look like, and what the process is going to be. So we're going to see a lot of those details here, and then we're going to plug a lot of them into current events and see how it aligns with what's happening today in our world and really through the past hundred years, maybe even five hundred years, We'll see the, through the next shiurim. We're going to have shiurim on Mashiach ben David, Mashiach ben Yosef, Tchiyas Amesim. There's a lot of different topics within this sugya to cover. So hopefully we're going to be able to get through everything. But as, as one hakdama, just very important. If you go to sheet, uh, page number four, on the top it says page four. This, you really need to be, begin with this line whenever you discuss any of these topics and any of these concepts. Because one danger is that you'll hear certain shiurim that, first of all, will not quote sources. And you have to understand, when it comes to these topics, it's all about the sources. How, how do you know what's gonna happen when Mashiach comes? How do, how do we know what's gonna happen in Olam Haba? These aren't things that are spoken about at length in the Gemara. You'll see that we, we gathered all of them together in one place. But you need to see the sources because, again, there's not a lot of clarity in what's happening and what's going to happen in the future world. And there's many different opinions. So you need to see the sources inside and you need to understand the subtleties that are involved. But here, if you look in the middle of the page where there's a double underline in the Rambam, this is in the Rambam over here, and this is after the Rambam brings lots of halafas and lots of gemaras and sources that speak about Mashiach, he writes, V'chol eilu hadvarim bahen lo yeda adam heyach yu ad No matter what he just said, and again, he said a lot of things up until now, we'll see some of them inside very soon, that seem like he's pretty much telling you exactly what's gonna happen. There's gonna be a king, he's gonna take over, there's gonna be a war, there's gonna be a new Torah, there's gonna be Nebuah. So then he says, however, he's giving a caveat. He's telling you, so well, you know what, you're only gonna know in retrospect. That's what he's saying. We'll say, yeah, we'll say. So he says, here, you will only know what these things are once they happen, because it's very unclear what is metaphorical and what is literal. Meaning, everything that it says is going to happen is going to happen. But is it going to happen in the metaphorical sense, where when you're reading what it says is gonna happen, is that literally what it's going to look like? Or is that, let's say, the soul of what's gonna happen, the idea of what's gonna happen, and it's not necessarily what it's gonna look like. So when someone gives a shear on these topics, they, this is exactly what's gonna happen. Boom, 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 boom. So he might be saying what's going to happen in conceptually what's going to happen. It's not necessarily what literally is going to happen. It might look very different. When it says there's gonna be Gog and Mogog, there's gonna be this great war, and these two kingdoms are gonna unify themselves and fight Kal Yisrael until they get all the Jewish people uh, besieged in Yerushalayim, and then half the Jew a third of the Jewish people die, a third are injured, a third survive. We don't know exactly what that's gonna look like. Is it gonna be a literal war? Is it going to be a literal battle? So it's unclear. Did it already happen? Did it not happen yet? What was World War II? So we'll discuss a lot of that, but this is just very important to know that when we, we're learning these things, we're learning the concepts. We're not necessarily learning, if you watched a movie, exactly what, what would happen. He's right. Even the Nevi'im, who saw prophetically what was going to unfold, they didn't even know exactly what they were seeing. There's nothing more hidden from the human race than what's going to happen in the future. So, but it's very important. You'll see that a lot of it is known. We'll discuss a lot of the details, but it's not clear exactly how it's going to happen. Yeah. I dive into a shell. The ship should come as soon as possible. Is that the right attitude to have? Yes, we'll go, we'll, we'll get there. But yes, yes, that is the right attitude to have. You want Mashiach to come? The more, the, the Vilna Gon says that the more we learn about Mashiach, the quicker we will bring Mashiach. You can't want something if you don't know what it is. If you never tasted a hamburger and you just heard about it, and you never even heard about it, you just heard the word hamburger, you have no idea what it is. So you're never really gonna want a hamburger if you have absolutely no idea what it is. Someone just said there's a thing called a hamburger. Okay, if you learn about it, if you taste it, if you smell it, so you're gonna want the hamburger, right? So the same thing happens with Mashiach. The more we learn about Mashiach, 
the more we'll appreciate what Mashiach is, even if we don't know exactly what it's going to look like. A lot we will know. We're going to discover a lot throughout these next few weeks. And only then can you really want it. And Mashiach really comes when the Jewish people want him. Part of bringing Mashiach, says the Vilna Gon, is having a deep ratzon, a desire for Mashiach, can bring Mashiach. So it's no coincidence we began the Shurim as we're getting very close to Rosh Chodesh Tammuz, and we're going to be entering in, into the Bain of Mitzarim, the three weeks. And the main avoda of the three weeks, when we're mourning over the destruction of the base of Mikdashim, both base of Mikdashes, is learning why we're in Golos, what is the purpose of exile, and how much we need to want Mashiach. That's going to be the whole avoda of three weeks to focus on that. You can't listen to music, right? you can't, can't do a lot of things because you're supposed to focus on the mourning and the availus. The mourning and the availus is not to be sad and depressed. It's to understand what we're missing, and only when you know what you're missing can you really desire it, can you really want it. So that's the goal of the Shurim, is to develop a deep desire for Mashiach to understand what we're working towards, and we'll also even understand what we're supposed to be doing. What are you supposed to be doing if you're gonna be preparing for Mashiach? What are you supposed to be doing? As Rav Kesson mentioned last night, Sheikh is very, very close. Max, max is 218 years, which means your great, great, great grandchildren for sure will see Mashiach, 100%. For sure will see Mashiach. That's, okay, so that's only a few generations, right? And most likely, you will see Mashiach. Most likely, if you had to bet. Because the Rambam says, and we'll see it inside, that Mashiach will have children and grandchildren that will rule under him within his dynasty. He will die. In fact, Rambam is going to write that he will die. And it will be a multi-generational dynasty. So if Mashiach, the Rambam says, again, we don't know what these things mean literally, but the Rambam says it pretty literally in Halakha, we'll see, that there's going to be multiple generations of this kingdom. So then Mashiach's not going to die at a young age. Come on, he's Mashiach. He's probably going to get to 120. And his kids are probably going to get to 120. So that's already you know, 240 right there, depending on when he comes. Like he, won't be, he won't be Mashiach when he's born. But you know, if he's Mashiach when he's 40 years old, so you have 80 years right there, you have 120 for his kids, you're already at 200. So you're very, very, very close to Yimur Mashiach. And like I said, the probability is that we will see him, that we will get to see Mashiach. That's the hope. So these are very important in to learn, and we'll see even why it's even more so important to know what you're supposed to do before Mashiach. Because once Mashiach comes, everything is going to change and you'll lose a lot of opportunities. We'll see very soon that there's a lot of opportunities that you can grab onto before Monsieur Sheikh comes. So if we have that time, we'll take advantage of it in a much more serious way. So let's dive into the sources. Like I mentioned, the Shir is going to be going through the sources. We want to know what Chazal and what the Gemara say about this. Later, we'll get to the Achronim and the more modern day rabbis and what they, they kind of put the pieces together for us and tell the story like Rav Kesson did last night. But even that, you have to use your own brain a lot, a lot of the time to understand what's going to happen because like the Rambam mentioned, a lot of these things are stumen. They're very closed. They're not clear exactly what the Gemara means. <coughs> okay. So here in the very first source, you have the Gemara of Zara. Sorry, the first source is, skip the first two little ones and we just get to the one that looks like a Gemara. It says a tess on the top left of that little source. So Tana Devei Eliyahu. Sheishis alafim shana havei haolam. So this is very important. The physical world will exist for 6,000 years. Shnei alafim tohu, 2,000 years will be called tohu, which means chaos. Shnei alafim Torah, 2,000 years are going to be called the period of Torah. Shnei alafim yimot Mashiach, and the last 2,000 years are called yimot Hamashiach. Ba'abonosenu sherabu yatsu mehen mashi yatsu mehen. And because of our sins, Whatever happened, happened. So what does it mean, whatever happened, happened? If you look down on Rashi, he's underlined. Shnei alafim Torah. So what's Torah below Yomar Mashiach? <coughs> it means there's going to be 2,000 years, that's the middle 2,000 years, are going to be without Yomar Mashiach, which is interesting. It sounds like Yomar Mashiach is not a person. It's not a, you know, it's not like he comes. It sounds like, it sounds like it's a concept. With the Torah without Mashiach. Shnei alafim Yomar Mashiach, b'varaseinu sherabu yatsu, nishnei alafim achronim. So it came out from the last 2,000 years, Mashi Yatsu, Mashiach Loba. Whatever happened, happened, and Mashiach still has not come. That's what Rashi says. So now we've established something. The world is 6,000 years. Rabbi Kesson mentioned this last night. Right, we are in year what? Five, seven, eight, two. So you have 218 years left until the year 6,000. What were the 2,000 years of Tohu? So those are 2,000 years before Abram Avinu. When did Abram Avinu get the command of Lech Lecha Me'artzacha, that he was supposed to travel to the land of Eretz Yisrael? So it's an easy way to remember, 1948. 
1948, right? Coincidence? Maybe. One year, 1948, Avram went on his mission of Lech Lecha, and then he became Avram, who he was, by the year 2000. When Avram became the chosen person, that was the end of a period known as Tohu Chaos. What does it mean, chaos? So the Ramchal explains in Derech Hashem that for the first 2,000 years, there was no chosen people. It, the game was wide open. Any individual that would come to the conclusion that God exists and work with all of his heart to serve Hashem in this physical world, he could have become the Avram Avinu and the Jewish people would have flowed out of him. So it was like uh, open tryouts for 2,000 years. So there was no direction of mankind because it was kind of a free-for-all. That's why it's called Toh. It's chaos. There's no Torah in the world. There's no clear commandments in the world. There was Sheva Mitzvah Spenei Noach. Okay, so there's a little bit of a structure, but nothing clear that we have from the 613. And then Avram Avinu comes on the scene. He recognizes Hashem through his own seichel by looking at the physical world. And that's the year 2000. So from 2000 on, you have a new reality called Torah. Torah was developed within those 2000 years. Those 2,000 years included Avram Yitzhak Yaakov, the 12 Shvatim, the Shivim Nefesh, the 70 souls that went down to Mitzrayim, Kalal Yisrael were in Kalas in Mitzrayim, they came out and they received the Torah. Obviously, that's the main event that happened in the 2,000 years of Torah. But not just them receiving the Torah, you also have the full development of Torah Shabal Peh. The Mishnah and the Gemara were written in this Tkufa, and it ended around the year 4,000, give or take, and that is the end of Torah. What does it mean, the end of Torah? Of course, we still develop Torah. That's the end of the seeds or the foundation of Torah. So you have the Gemara and the Mishnah are written, that's the end of that 2,000 years. And then with the destruction of the second base of Mikdash, you pretty much enter into the last 2,000 years of history that we're in right now. Rabbi Akiva, who lived during the times of the second base of Mikdash, destruction, so Rabbi Akiva already thought that he knew who Mashiach was. Who do you think Mashiach was? Bar Kochma. Rabbi Akiva, he thought Mashiach was coming all the way at the beginning, meaning because he knew that once the year 4,000 hit, it could potentially be Yimod Mashiach. Mashiach could come at any time between the year 4,000 and 6,000. So Rabbi Akiva thought it was right in the beginning. Bar Kofka was right in the beginning. And he wasn't Zohar, he was not Mashiach. But that's when Rabbi Akiva thought Mashiach was going to come. Now, Mashiach, like we saw over here, there's something called Yimod Mashiach, and there's something called Mashiach. Now, one way to look at Yimod Mashiach is, okay, there's a 2,000 year window, and Mashiach can come any time in the 2,000 years. Until he comes, it's just like nothing. It's just neutral. Those years are just neutral until Mashiach comes. Or, and we'll see this a lot, a lot more in the future, that Mashiach can be a process. It can be a process that begins in the last 2,000 years. So that the last 2,000 years of history really has a very different flavor than the rest of human history. Yeah. It's all pre preparation moving towards Mashiach. And we'll see that as we get closer to actual Mashiach, to when Mashiach actually arrives, everything, the table is getting set. The table is getting set. So obviously, getting the land of Israel was a huge piece in setting the table. Already, even before we got the land of Israel, there were thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jews that were moving to the land of Israel. So the table is pretty much almost set. You, if anyone's visited Israel lately, imagine Mashiach came, and a hundred years ago. So where would we all live? In huts in, on sand dunes. Right? There was nothing. Israel was desolate, barren. It would not have been a triumphant return to Yerushalayim if you'd go to a land that was completely broken and destroyed. So Hashem is setting the table for Mashiach. If you go to Eretz Yisrael now, it's unbelievable what they're building. It's unbelievable what you're seeing. No idea. Unbelievable. No idea. Beautiful buildings popping up. It's going to be. It's going to be. A, it's a first world country. It's going to be a metropolis. It's going to be the light unto all the nations. It's going to be the capital. Mashiach is going to sit there by the Kotel. And, I mean, it's going to be by the base of Mikdash at that point, but. It's, it's setting the table. Right now, everything's moving towards Mashiach. We're almost there. So you'll, you'll see as things move, get closer, so you'll see things that are miraculous, that we, we grew up with them. At least I did. I grew up with the land of Israel existing. But you see the Six-Day War. You see open miracles that are occurring as Hashem is laying the groundwork for Mashiach. So how long is Yemot Mashiach going to be? So it's a very interesting question. So most people say, okay, like we have no idea. Like when's Mashiach going to come? So I mentioned, okay, he has to come before the year 6,000. If perhaps right now we have 218 years, he could come one minute before the year 6,000. <laughs> Hypothetically, the, the Yemot HaMashiach, like the actual uh, beautiful reality that we're going to live in, this utopian existence, could last one minute. Because Mashiach could come at the very, very end. That nobody said how long it, it has to be. However, if you look here in the second source in this, in this Gemara, in the middle of the sheet, we're just going to do the underline, because they learned from Sukkim. 
So one opinion says, Tanya, Rabbi Eliezer, Omer, Yemoda Mashiach, Arbaim Shana. Bam! Mefurish. Yemoda Mashiach, 40 years. So we might not see it. Oh no. Right? 40 years. It says Yemoda Mashiach is going to be 40 years, which is implying that from the time Mashiach comes until the year 6000, is going to be 40 years. So if that's the case, most of us will not be there. However, if you look down the line, Rabbi Elazar ben Azari Omer, Shivim Shana. Okay, we're getting closer. Right? 70 years. So maybe it's going to be 70 years. Look down a little lower. Okay, Rebbe Omer, Shlosha Doros. It's going to be three generations. In Gemara, usually 70 years is a generation. So there you have 210 years. Now we're really close. 70 years? I don't think 70 years generation. <laughs> hey, you get very close. 70 years is three generations. Three, no, no, 70 years is one generation. So three generations is 210 years. So then you're very, very close. Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Yemur Mashiach, Arba Imshana. It's another opinion, 40 years. Rabbi Dosa Omer, Dalad Meoshana, 400 years. So we missed that one. 400 years. Rebbe Omer, Gimel Meos, Veshishim, Vechamei Shana, 365 years. We missed that one. Rebbe Abao, Yemon Veshich, Lisrael, Shivim Alafim Shana. That's the hardest one. It's going to be 7,000 years. Okay, how does that one make sense? I'm not sure. Right? No, like, I think 7,000 years, sorry. The Mashiach will be the last. One thousand years. <laughs> he sounds. He says. That sounds like Yimor Mashiach. He says Yimor Mashiach Yisrael Shivas Alafim Shana, and it's not even in the seven thousands already past the six thousand date. Amar of Yehuda, Amar of Shmuel, Yimor Mashiach, Kemiyom Shenivra Olam Varachshav. It's the same amount of time from when the world was created until he actually made that statement. Okay. Then Reb Nachman Bar Yitzchak says Kimei Noach Arachshav from when Noach was created until now, and then Amar of Yochanan Kol Hanavim Kulam Lo Nisnabu Eli Yimor Mashiach. And now we're going to see a very important machlokis. So first of all, let's just lay down. It's clear from this Gemara, we have no idea when Mashiach is going to come. But what do these dates mean? Well, they're just throwing out random numbers. So you should know, there were many gedol and many tzaddikim that called Mashiach, or attempted to call Mashiach. They tried to say when Mashiach is going to come. They gave dates. Almost every date has passed. Even the Rambam, who we'll see in his halacha, writes, you should not predict the date of Mashiach, predict it a date for Mashiach. He writes, why, why should you not predict the date for Mashiach? Because if it passes, so the Jewish people are going to get depressed and they're going to lose hope. So it's not good to predict dates. But the Gemara already shows you that there were dates predicted. So what does it mean when they predicted a date? It means there are auspicious times that Mashiach can come. What would be very interesting is if someone would calculate these years and tell me what happened in these years in history. Maybe there were major world events. Maybe you see the Six-Day War. I don't know, something amazing where it was almost Mashiach, but we weren't there. Almost, but not quite. But there are auspicious times when Mashiach can come. And things happen during those times. Another notch is created that gets us one step closer to Mashiach. So these aren't random dates. These, these are very important dates. And as you see, most of them have passed. So we're getting very, very close. Big events have taken place. And we'll get into it much more into detail in the later year when we get into Mashiach ben Yosef and the process uh, that, that, that that takes. So if you look down into the Medrash of Shira Shirim, now we're going to discuss something very, very interesting. What's it going to look like before Mashiach comes? What is the generation before Mashiach going to look like? So there's another Gemara that I didn't bring here on the sheets, that there's many Tanaim that say, Mashiach should come, but I don't want to be there to see him. And then another Tana says, Mashiach should come, but I don't want to be there to see him. So why do you say I don't want to be there to see him? Because the predictions of when Mashiach does come are quite scary. <laughs> it's not going to be a walk in the park. It's not going to be frolicking in flowery fields. It's going to be a very, very scary period of time before Mashiach comes. So these Tanam are saying, I want Mashiach, but I don't want to be there to witness it. I'll, I'll wait for Tchis and Mason. You'll bring me back once it's over, you wake me up when, when, when it's time. I don't want to be there to watch it happen. So why do they say that? So you have to see the sources. Before we see that. So if you look in these sources at the bottom of the sheet, Amr Eish Lakish. Dor Shabin David Ba. So the generation of Mashiach is going to come. Beis Havad Yilaz Nus. So it means that the house of the Chachamim, the places where the Chachamim would, get, would gather together, will be a place of immorality. Galil Yechorov, the north will be destroyed. Vagvolen Yisum, Vaanshe Galil Yisavavu, Meir Leir, Velo Yechanenu. The people of the north who have their houses and their land destroyed will search for a place to live and they won't find it. They won't find the camp. The Chachmas HaSofrim Tisrach, and the wisdom of the scribes will become putrid. Who's mean the north? We don't know. V'yirei Chet, Chesed, Nesafim, and those that fear Hashem, and those that do Chesed will become very few. And it'll be very hard to determine the truth. The truth will disappear. Sound like the time you recognize? Democrats. 
Upnei hador kepnei hakelev. And this is something very important. And the face of the generation will be like the face of a dog. And everything's very, very cryptic. We'll explain some of these. But the face of the generation will be like the face of a dog. Okay. And then, okay, next, skip down to the next paragraph. Rabbanon Amrei, Dor Shben David Ba. Ba Chachme Ador Mesim. The, the, the wise men of the generation will be wiped out, they will die. But now, sorry, my name, Kalos Biyagim Anacha. And those that remain, their eyes will become weary from difficulty and from hardship. The Tsaros Rabos, the Rabos, Rabos, Baos, Ala Tibor. And terrible Tsaros will, will, will attack the Tibor. Ugzeros Kashos, Mishadshos. And there'll be new decrees against the Jewish people. Umishtalfos, Ad Sharishona Kayemes, Acheres Ba, Benismecha La. And until the next degree comes, the first degree, the first decree won't even be finished. So you're just going to have terrible events, one after another, lined up. Next, Amar Rabbi Naharai, Dor Shemed David Ba, Han Arim Yalbinu Lezikainim. The young people will not have any respect for their elders. The Yam Du Hazikainim Bifnei Han Arim, and not only that, but the elders will respect the young. The, the elder, the older people who, in the previous generations, wow, they have wisdom, so much life experience. Now they'll, they'll wish they were young. They'll get plastic surgery. Right? They'll go worship the athletes. They'll, they'll wish those greater years of the young because when you're old, it's, it's, it's empty, it's meaningless. Bas kama be'ima, kala be'chamosa. Daughters will, the mother, mothers will get up for daughters and mother-in-laws for their daughter-in-laws. Oive ish anche beso. There will not be a lot of uh, happy families. The people of the household will actually fight with each other. Uben eno misbayish me'aviv. And a child will not have any embarrassment before his father. They'll have crazy amounts of chutzpah. Yeah, a generation sure. filled with chutzpah. Here we are. Yeah. Uh, last one. Rebbe Nechem Yaomer, Kodem Yimur Mashiach, Anius Yarbe. There'll be tremendous poverty. This one, we're not there yet. Looks pretty good around us right now. The Yoker Hava, the Gemara actually says in another place, Yoker Hava means it'll be tremendous, um, tremendously high prices. So Yoker Hava, in another place, the Gemara says, it literally says inflation. Not the word inflation, but it says that, that prices will go up tremendously and that dollars won't be worth anything, money will not be worth anything. So it predicts, um, rampant inflation, maybe. I get in Tite and Piria by Yain Yasriah, the Machus Kala, Tafef, I'm missing a line here, but it says again that the face of the generation will be like the face of a dog. Okay, so we see a lot of very dire predictions as to what Mashiach will look like, at least the time before Mashiach. So what does it mean? And it mentions it two times, it's cut off on the bottom, but that the face of the generation will be like the face of a dog. So I'll tell you two Pshatim that, that, that I've heard that are really very, very amazing. One is from Yisrael, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. Yisrael Salanter says, what does it mean the generation's face will be like the face of a dog? Mm-hmm. So why were they, and, and you'll see, it's, it's not just here in, in the Medrash here, the Gemara says this, very often it keeps going over and over again, the face of the generation will be like the face of a dog. What is so unique about a dog? What's so unique about a dog? So Yisrael Salanter says, a dog is, is very interesting. A dog, when you walk a dog, so he looks like he's leaving the, the owner. Right? He's out in front and he's striding along. But, but if he's a good dog, so every 10 steps he looks back to see if, if, if the owner is still walking. He's always looking back to make sure you're, you know, you're with him. So he looks like he's leaving, but really he's looking back. He's, really, he's, not, he's not leading, he's a follower. He's following ahead. He's following ahead. So Mishra Salanta says, what's going to happen before Mashiach comes? So there's going to be a new form of government. It's a government where the leaders are not leaders, the leaders are actually followers. They look like they're leaders, but every two minutes they keep looking behind and say, is this okay? Okay, good. What do you call that? That's democracy. <laughs> democracy is not about, very rarely will you get a leader elected in a de- de- democratic system. A guy that just says what he thinks, I mean, we had one in the last presidential election, a guy that just doesn't care what anyone else says, but he'll just say what he thinks, and people like, liked it. Not everyone liked it, some people hated it. Um, but generally, in a democratic election, so they take polls and they say, okay, what do people want? Okay, that's my policy. My policy is what the majority of people want, because if I say what the majority of people want, so I'll get elected, because that's how democracy works. It happens to be that the ideal form of government, if you're dealing with righteous individuals, is monarchy. Mashiach is going to be a king. He's not going to have a parliament. There will not be a parliament of Mashiach. There will not be a congress and a senate of Mashiach. Right? There won't be a supreme court. There will be Mashiach. Mashiach will be the king. Why is monarchy generally not the preferred form of government? Because generally, the most, most ruthless, psychotic individual becomes king. So it's not a good system. But very, sometimes, like Shlomo Melech, you'll get the wisest man of the entire generation to become king. The most merciful person, the person with the greatest chesed, you'll only want what's best for the people. That's the best government you'll ever have. If you have the, the most righteous individual alive, 
that is only following Torah and the will of Hashem. And he's the, the leader, undisputed. He's the dictator. That's amazing. You want to live under that dictator, trust me. He's going to guide you in the right direction. He's going to make sure you get to Olam Haba. And he's going to make sure that Hashem is happy with the Jewish people. If Hashem is happy with us, then he sends physical bracha. Everything looks great. The 40 years that Shlomo Melech was king, you know, it was that, that non-Jews were not allowed to convert. We did not accept Geirim. Also during the month of Shiach, we're not going to accept Geirim. Why are we not going to accept converts? Because the Jews are on top, right? It's going to, it's going to be so good to be a Jew that who wouldn't want to join? Who wouldn't want to join? A Geir is impressive when we're in Gullus. That's very impressive. Someone wants to join the Jewish people when they're getting stomped on. So we want them to join our team. That's what we want on the team. But when someone joins during the month of Shiach, Shlomo Melech, so it'll be the good, the good old days, right? No, we, we don't accept Geirim during that time. So... Pnei Hador ki Pnei Akeled means that there will be no leadership in the world. The masses will be leading the world. And generally the masses are after money, fame, physical desires, pleasure. They're not after uh, the righteous things that we strive towards. They're after instant gratification. So the whole world will be chasing instant gratification and there won't be any leaders around that will actually preach morals and ethics and chesed. So that, that, that's one understanding of Pnei Hador ki Pnei Akeled. And you should know, there was never democracy ever in the history of the world before, I mean, okay, you had it in Greece a little bit, but as a mass movement, you didn't have it until America came on the scene. And even then, that was one of the only countries that had it. And okay, England had it before, America had it, then it spread it slowly, slowly. It's really the first time in human history, is only a few hundred years ago, that you have mass governments that are using a democratic model. So that could be, depends from Mashiach. But I'll tell you, the, my, my favorite shot, I think a, a deeper shot, and, a, and it's interesting, is from Ramosha Shapiro. There's a Gemara that says that Rabbi Gamal, Rabbi Gamaliel and Rabbi Yeshua were on a boat together. They went on a sea voyage. And Rabbi Yeshua brought extra rations of food, more than were necessary for the trip. And on the trip, they got lost. They got lost at sea, and Rabbi Yeshua saved them because he had the extra food. So Rabbi Gamaliel told him, how did you know to bring extra food? How do you know, you know, you, you pack light when you go on a sea voyage, you don't want to have extra bags on your ship. So how do you know to pack extra? So he said, oh, it's obvious. The Gemara says that once every 70 years, there's a star that appears in the sky that throws off the sailors. The sailors used to navigate the seas based on the stars. So he says they had the map of the world based on the stars. And they knew where they were standing based on what the sky looked like. And every 70 years, there'd be a star that would appear, move across the sky, it would throw people off, and everybody would get lost. So that's what he said. Okay. So, literal, martial, so, the Gemara is very deep. In what 70 years, we said a second, 70 years is a generation. 70 years is a generation. So, Rabbi Moshe Shapiro said that once every 70 years, once in a generation, there's a concept, or an idea, or a philosophy, that looks true, it looks really good, but it'll throw off the entire world. The entire world will chase this thing only to find out later that they totally missed the boat, right? That, that they lost their way at sea. The Gemara says that, that life in this world is compared to an ocean, right? You're, you're, you're sailing on the stormy seas. So in this world, when you're sailing on the stormy seas, once every 70 years, there's something that's gonna throw off the world. So Ramos Shapiro said that he asked a, a very big gadol, what was that star in the previous generation? What was that? concept, that idea, that philosophy that threw off the entire world. So can anyone guess what it is? What? The what? Enlightenment. Enlightenment. That was actually pretty good for the rest of the world. It was bad for the Jewish people. But for the rest of the world, it brought us to a pretty good spot where we're holding right now. So I guess more, more recent than that, a little more recent than that. That was probably, that was, that was already in the, in the 1800s. No. No. I mean, that's maybe literally. It's an ism. Communism. Communism. Communism on paper looked like the greatest movement that you've ever seen. Right? Take the power away from the wealthy that put down the poor. And remember, right now America, you know, the wealthy aren't necessarily crushing and you know, turning the poor into serfs and into slaves. But that's what it was like for thousands of years. That the rich did, weren't just rich and the poor were poor. The rich enslaved the poor. It was a terrible, uh, terrible to be living in any of those times of history. So communism came along and said, let's distribute the wealth equally. Everybody will do their share, doctors will be doctors, lawyers will be lawyers, people who work the land will work the land, and everybody will share. And you know what? On a small scale, it actually works. 
There's kibbutzim that actually still do this today. I was driving, I got a ride with someone from a, from a, from a kibbutz once, and they told me, I uh, said, oh, is this your car? No, it's not my car, this is the kibbutz's car. The kibbutz has 50 cars. Everybody can, it's like a car sharing app. So you reserve the car and you get to take out the car. I said, oh, what do you do? So this person works in high tech, they're computer programming, they, they make a lot of money. In Israel, they made a lot of money. And they actually live the same as the person who cleans the shul in that neighborhood. It's, it's, it, it's one of the only kibbutzim left that's pure communism where they actually share the money equally. Almost every other kibbutz has already left that model and there's a few little aspects that they share, a few things they share, but almost everything is uh, capitalistic. But communism, and, and it was a beautiful, if you're all Jews and everyone gets along and everyone's in it for the same purpose to learn Torah and to do mitzvahs and, and you share your wealth equally, so that sounds very good on paper, right? Communism sounds beautiful. So the whole world was taken by this romantic concept called communism. There was a star that, that popped up into the sky and countries started running after it until they found out that it's probably the worst form of government ever. Because <laughs> when you try to do that on a mass scale, so it's, it's, it's like a monarchy. Certain people will take control and then they will enslave the rest of the people and it was probably more starvation and slavery and murder through communism than any other ism that ever existed. As communism was terrible, terrible. What, what I think they estimate that like 100 million people died in China from communism. 60 million, 30 million in the Soviet Union. I saw that graph once, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, mil millions more people than died in, in world wars. Yeah. More people than died in the world wars. Died from communism. Isn't that crazy? Just a form of government killed more people than literal wars where you're trying to kill people. In Russia, they would starve people, they would shoot people, they would wipe people Soviets. out. Soviets. Soviets, yeah. So, so that, that, that's communism, that's a star. So he asked, or so Moshe Shapiro asked, this, this guy, though, so he said, what's the star in our generation? Oh, that's a, that's a good one. Facebook. <laughs> this is pre-Facebook, so maybe that's the next one. So he said, this is probably 30 years ago that he asked him this question. So again, it's gonna be like a, it's gonna be a concept. It's gonna be a concept that the world chases that will change the way you look at reality, but it's going to be false and it's going to usually lead the world down the wrong path. So, no, I don't think you're gonna guess it, but I wouldn't have guessed it. But he said, what is it? He said, it's evolution. Isn't that evolution? That's just, that's just a nice theory that they teach in science books. Nobody cares about evolution. That doesn't, that doesn't make the world shift. That doesn't do anything. So he said, no, no, you don't understand what evolution really is. Evolution means, huh? No God. No God. There's one, one thing. You can say there's no God. Say there's no God. That's one, yeah, that would be one, one, one uh, outgrowth of evolution is to say there's no God. But another thing it does, in terms, more in terms of what it does to a society, is it, it tells human beings that they're actually animals. There's really no difference between a human and an animal. You're just an advanced monkey, right? There's no, soul to monkeys. there's no soul, there's no altruism, there's no chesed in the world. Everyone is just chasing their animal motives and that's actually healthy because survival of the fittest, right? The more animalistic you are, the better you're gonna do because evolution means find out who's strongest and he will be the next chain in the, in, in, in the, in the link, the next link in the chain. So it, it really shifts the reality that the whole world becomes animalistic. Everyone thinks that they're an animal. They think they're an animal and think there's no reason to strive for morals and ethics and to elevate and to transcend and to believe in the soul and religion and worship. What do you mean worship? You're just a monkey. What are you, what are you worshiping? You're wasting your time. You should be going out to have more children, to uh, make more money, whatever's gonna increase your chances for survival. That's what, the, that's what life is all about. So that's what they would tell you. So what does it mean, Pnei Ador ke Pnei Akelev? So there's one animal, and this the Gemara says also, that, that a kelev has what's called ha'aza. Ha'aza, ha'aza means it's brazen. And a dog is brazen. What does it mean a dog is brazen? So when it says a dog is brazen, in that a dog is the only animal that thinks he's a person. He thinks he's a person. He thinks he's, very few animals will jump onto your table while you're eating and take the food off of your plate that's in front of you. Most animals are scared of a person when he's eating his food. They're not going to jump on and, and... Not wild animals. Not wild animals, yeah, maybe. Ah, even when a person's there, I've never had a raccoon take the food off my plate while I'm sitting there eating it. Right? They're usually scared of human beings. They won't come there and grab it. When you leave, they'll take the food. They won't come and grab it. A dog thinks he's a person. No animal has the gall to lick you in the face. Right? To jump up and lick you in the face. He will kiss you, he will hug you. The dog thinks he's a person. And in fact, right, what happened in, in, the, in this last generation? We believe him. And all dogs go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> See, we'll, get, we'll get to that maybe. But we believe the dog. You can, 
You walk down New York City today, you will see dogs wearing clothing. And you won't even flinch because what do you mean? Of course dogs wear clothing, they're cold, right? It's raining outside. Of course a dog has, has a raincoat. Of course they have dogs wearing shoes. Of course a dog's wearing shoes is gonna hurt his feet, right? There is, there is a dog restaurant. It's a dog restaurant where you take your dog to a restaurant, right? They push him in a baby stroller, right? What happened? The dogs were so convincing because once you have evolution and you say that a person's really an animal, so that if an animal thinks he's a person, so he's right. Who's to say he's not a person? You, you're just another animal, just like him. So if he thinks he's a person, so he's a person. So what, what, what you would have seen 50 years ago, if someone saw a dog walking down the street in a sweater, 50 people would have gathered around them and they wouldn't believe their eyes. A dog in a sweater, are you crazy? They would have laughed at that person. Now, if your dog's not wearing a sweater, someone would be like, are you kidding, he's freezing. Put a sweater on him. Are you crazy? So what happened? So evolution came, came into the picture. And Pnei Hador ke Pnei Akele means the generation's face will be like the, gener- like the face of a dog. But just like a dog thinks he's a person. So people will think they're animals. People think they're animals. And the whole society will run, will be running after animalistic urges. And that's what the generation will look like before Mashiach. So I think we've, we've pretty much gotten there in what we see around us. Okay. Now we're going to see a very, very important my focus that's going to be a basis. And right now, t- tonight we're laying down a lot of the foundations. And then we're going to kind of make it flow in more of like a story in the, in the next year to kind of explain them. But here you have to have the basic pieces because in all of the later svarim that discuss these topics, they're all basing themselves off of these sources in the Gemara. Because again, just to point out, whenever you learn Torah, so you always have to build off earlier sources. Anyone that just says... This is the way it is, because I thought, I thought that way. I'm the first person to ever say it, so you should question that person. Right? If, he's not the, if he's the Arizal, maybe he's the greatest tzaddik of the generation, it's okay, maybe he has revelations from Eliyahu Navi, and that's how he knows, and we believe the Arizal, even though he doesn't always bring sources. Very rarely does he bring sources. But if you see an average person saying, this is what this angel does, and this is what happens in Shemaim during this time, okay, if he's not telling you where he's getting that from, so you should be suspect, at best, at best. So you need to always know the foundations that they're working off of because they can't work outside of the framework that's given to us by Chazal. Chazal are the rabbis of the Gemara, of the Medrash, and of the Mishnah. That's, that's what we refer to when we say Chazal. So that's why these sources are going to be working in chronological order. We're always going to see the Gemaras, the Midrashim, and then we're going to work to the Rambam, to the Ramban, to the Rishonim, or the next link in the chain. And then you get the rabbis that have lived in the past few hundred years that kind of are the ones who speak about the topic much more robustly. They really go into it and the previous generations did not, they're very cryptic. <coughs> you need to see the cryptic sources if you're gonna be able to plug the later sources back into the, the foundations. So that's why we're seeing these, but even, even though these kind of will seem like a little bit piecemeal. Okay, so says the Gemara, here in the Mishnah, we'll just do the other line pieces. Lo ish lo So the Gemara on Shabbos says that a person is not allowed to go out on Shabbos with his sword. It is sir of Hotzah. If there's no Erev, so you're not allowed to carry your sword on Shabbos. Okay. the okay, so why are you not allowed to carry your sword on Shabbos? So the Keshit, you're not allowed to take a we'll keep going after the underline, you can't go with your arrow, you can't go with your armor, not with your spear, and if you go out your Chaib Khatas, that's the first opinion. Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Tachshitin Hainlo. You are allowed to go out with them. Why? Because it's jewelry. Just like a woman can walk out with her earrings and her necklace. So a man, what's his jewelry? His sword and his spear. His sword and his spear is jewelry. No, they say that weapons are not jewelry. They're disparaging. You can't go out with weapons. They're gnai. They're, 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 they're negative. You don't, your person wouldn't want to wear them and show them off as jewelry. How does he know that? How does the Chavim know that? The kitetu charvosam le'itim v'chan yinoseihem le'mazmeros v'lo yisa goi el goi cherev v'lo yilmudu od milchama. That in the times of Mashiach, there'll be no more war. What's going to happen? They're going to convert their swords into plows, oh, sure. and their armor is going to be into other digging implements, and they're going to use it for farming. World peace. You don't need the weapons anymore. I've heard a, a, a certain tzaddik that said that this means that uh, we'll have enough energy from all the weapons that we've created, nuclear energy from nuclear reactors, that it'll power the world. That's what it means. Today, it means all the weapons will be used to power the world. I think someone said that if you take the budget of of all of the military expenditures in the world from all the countries, every person in the world could get a million dollars. 
something crazy like that. Yeah, more than that. It's a crazy, crazy number. Take all of the military expenditures in the world. It's a, it's an astronomical number. So you have to understand, when Mashiach comes, it might not be that there's going to be so much more prosperity. We're just not going to need weapons anymore. It's if you stop producing weapons and you convert all of them into energy, so then you'll, you'll have a pretty good world that you're going to get to live in. Okay, so that, that, that's what the Mishnah says. So in the Gemara, there, it explains what this Machlok is, is about. So it says, Tanya, after it says little Gemara words, it says, after the two dots, Tanya. Amrulul Rabbi Eliezer. If you're telling me that weapons are jewelry for a man, so then why are we going to get rid of them in Yimor Mashiach? Amar Lahen, so he says to them, If you should on Tzrichim. And Rabbi Lezer says, because, oh, sorry, uh, Rabbi Lezer says, because they're not going to be needed. Shnemar Lisa Goy, Goy Cherev, Petahabe, Lenoi, Be'alma. They're going to be jewelry. You're not going to need them, they're going to be jewelry. Aval. Abai, he did the hava ashtrag batira upligid shmu. Okay, fine. It's gonna be like a like a. So Abai says that's not a good reason because it's gonna be like having a candle in the broad daylight. No one's gonna want jewelry of a weapon if you're not gonna have any use for the weapon. So you're not gonna use it. So it says upligid shmu. Now here's the important part that I want to show. Damar shmu. Ein bein haolam hazeli imor mashiach ella shibud galios bilvat. Shmu says there is no difference between the way the world looks right now and imor mashiach other than Shibud Galios, which means other than the Goyim being in control of the world and suppressing the Jewish people and oppressing the Jewish people. That's the only thing that's going to be different. There's going to be what world... Jewish oppressing the Jewish people. Shibud Galios means we're in Galus and they are in control and the Jewish people are on the bottom. So right? that's when Mashiach comes? No, it's that, that, that he's saying that the Yomot Mashiach, once Mashiach comes, nothing's going to change. It's not going to be a miraculous existence. It's going to be the regular day-to-day -day life we live now. You have to imagine that day-to-day -day life, which you can already kind of imagine it in America a little bit. But you're basically going to get to sit and learn, and you're going to have unlimited funds, unlimited money, and just serve Hashem all day without having to worry about anything. And all of the Goyim and the other world religions are going to recognize that the Jewish people are the chosen people. There will only be one religion in the world. Shiach will be the king of the entire world. All the Jewish people live in the land of Israel. But the world is going to run the way it runs. Everything is going to pretty much look the same. It's just going to be a utopian existence. So it doesn't, doesn't say Tchiyas HaMesim in Yimur Mashiach. We're going to have to, that's going to be the later Shurim. When is Tchiyas HaMesim and what is Tchiyas HaMesim? It's not clear at all. Last night we heard one opinion that said after the first 40 years of Mashiach, Tchiyas HaMesim is going to happen. But that is very not clear. Most sources do not sound like that at all. Tchiyas HaMesim will be right before Olam Haba. Then there's some sources that say maybe there'll be an earlier Tchiyas HaMesim for the Tzadikim. So we'll see the different sources when we get to Tchiyas HaMesim. But regular Yimur Mashiach, don't assume there's anyone getting revived from the dead. It's just going to be a really good time to be alive. Like when Shlomo Melech was king. Right? Like we said, Shlomo Melech was almost a taste of Yom Mashiach. There was Beis HaMikdash. All of the kings of the world paid homage to Shlomo Melech. He was recognized as the wisest of all men. World peace. There was no war during those 40 years. There was ultimate affluence in the land of Israel. Nobody was starving. Nobody was poor. Everybody was doing just fine. And they were sitting and learning Torah all day long. Will converts be alive during the era of Mashiach? No, no converts. No, no converts. converts. Just, no. Like just like Shlomo Melech, yeah, like you said. Same thing. No, no converts, because that'll be the, the, good, the good old days, right? Just like the good old days. So that is the opinion she of Shmuel. The what? She didn't convert. She just came and respected Shlomo Melech very nicely. It's unclear if she married him or what happened, but it doesn't sound like she married. She went back home after. But the 300 wives and 7 concubines you're saying didn't become Jewish? So I don't know when they converted. You're right. It says that Shlomo Melech did convert them. I'm because not sure the when thing they is, to be married to the king, they have to follow the religion of the king. Absolutely. But Shlomo Melech was punished because he built houses of Avodah Zarah for the women. Which is what the Navi says, which is very strange. How could Shlomo Melech do that? Okay, there's a, there's a separate sheep of Shlomo Melech. Probably one of the most complicated biblical characters. At the end of his life, it's very unclear what happened to him. He went a little crazy. A demon king took his spot on the throne. There's a whole long story in the, in the Medrash there, but uh, that's for another time. Okay, so fine. That's that's the opinion of Shmuel. How does Shmuel know that the world is going to look exactly the same? Shenemar kilo yechdel evyon miker ba'aretz, because the pasuk says there will never be, be be a time when there will not be poverty in the world. There will always be poor people in the world. He says that there's always going to be poor people in the world. So it's going to be utopian existence. Everyone's going to share, but there will be poor people. And there's going to be poor people, so it's going to look like a regular, like a regular world. It says, However, 
the opinion that we saw earlier of the of the, the fact that there won't be any war in the world helps Rabbi Chibar Abba. Dumb Rabbi Chibar Abba, Kol Hanavim Lo Nisnabu Eli Mor Vashiach. Now we're going to see. There's a lot of concepts in, that we see in Navi that they speak about La Asid Lavo. Now Asid Lavo is very is a very general term. What does Asid Lavo means? Right? In the future it means in the future. <coughs> in the time that, that is coming, the future that is coming. So what's that talking about? So this is a big machlokas. In the Nevi'im, they talk about a very supernatural existence. It says that the lion and the sheep will sleep together, and will, even an, animals will no longer kill one another. The whole world will shift into a very different existence. So it's unclear, and the Nevi'im speak about miraculous things happening, the whole nature of the world changes. So were the Nevi'im talking about Mashiach or Olam Haba? That's the machlokis here. There's a big, big machlokis. What were the Nevi'im talking about? Through all of Navi, you'll read all these psukim about the Asid Lavo. What were they talking about? If they were talking about Yemur Mashiach, so then Yemur Mashiach is this miraculous existence that's very different than the world we see in front of us today. And then, right, if, if they're talking about Yemur Mashiach. And then Olam Haba, we have no idea what it is. Olam Haba, we have no idea what it is. No one ever spoke about Olam Haba, according to this opinion. Everything they spoke about, everything that the Prophet spoke about was Mashiach, we have no idea what Olam Haba is going to be. That's one opinion. Shmuel's opinion is that Yemot Mashiach are going to be exactly like this world. Everything is going to run the same way it is now. So what were the prophets speaking about? They were speaking about Olam Haba. So he says they did speak about Olam Haba, and Yemot Mashiach is the same way the world runs now. So this machlokis is fundamental. This is crazy. This is a machlokis. What is the world going to look like when Mashiach comes? We don't know. This is the tenet of Jewish faith. Mashiach. We have no idea what it's going to be like. So we're going to see... Mizrat Hashem, in the coming shirim, because we're going to have to end now, um, what this all means. How do we paskin in this machlokis? And we're going to see that the Rambam actually paskins both ways. In one place he writes like Shmuel, and the other place he writes like Rabbi Yochanan, which is very, very strange. So we'll have to answer that question, and I'll tell you just a foreshadow preview. It's dependent on the two Mashiachs. Remember always, there are two Mashiachs. There's Mashiach ben Yosef, and there's Mashiach ben David. And it's never clear what anyone is talking about, because they usually don't write the word Ben David or Ben Yosef. They just write Mashiach, Yimor HaMashiach, Yimor Bush Mashiach. What do those two periods look like? What's the goal of each? Is it, is it a person? Is Mashiach Ben Yosef a person? Mashiach Ben David is for sure a person. Is Mashiach Ben Yosef a person? What's the purpose? So that, hopefully, we'll start getting to the Sugi Mashiach Ben Yosef, and that will also explain really? what's happening in our world over the past hundred years. It doesn't say Mashiach, it says Ben David, ain't Ben David Ba. Those are those previous, yeah, those previous Gemaras. That's Ben yes, David. So that, that's clearly talking about Mashiach Ben David. Those Gemaras. Mm -hmm. We saw many sources that just said Yemot Mashiach. What's Yemot Mashiach? Which Mashiach? Right? But it says Ben David, that's talking about Mashiach Ben David. But many times it doesn't say who it's talking about. It just says Mashiach. Yemot Mashiach. Okay, so those, those we'll see next time. Okay. Shalom, everyone.